after cooler day today, but even colder weather is ahead in the next couple. And also, we're watching the Ohio River going into flood stage and could go quite high in some locations. I'll have the latest on what to expect. And with about 70,000 customers still without power across West Virginia, we'll tell you when the lights are expected to come back on. Started through the house and that's when the roof come off and the ceiling collapsed on my husband and hit him in the head, but he's okay. And by then the storm was over. A small community in Fayette County checking the damage after a possible tornado hit. How they're handling the aftermath. And with major flooding possible by the end of the week, we're going to take a look at preparations along the Ohio River. Eyewitness News at 5 starts right now. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. You know, we've had a lot of weather over the past, what, 24 hours? 36 hours, something like that, Doug. But you know, the storms are causing thousands of customers all across West Virginia to go dark. Well, Eyewitness News anchor Gina Marini has the very latest on restoration efforts and joins us live from the Coles parking lot, which is surrounded by bucket trucks. Gina. Hi, Dave. Yeah, I'm going to step out of the way, but as you can see here behind me, there are a few of those bucket trucks lined up. I know we posted a picture earlier on X that shows how many bucket trucks are here. Now, that number has gone down, which is a good thing because it means crews are out working. I spoke with Appalachian Power just a short while ago. They tell me there are a little more than 20... 200 crews working with a little more than 2,100 of those coming from out of state. Some of those crews coming as far away as Indiana and Missouri. Karen Wissing from Appalachian Power says at the peak of the storm, about 125,000 customers were without power. Now, I just checked the outage map. Right now, it's showing there are just over 72,000 customers still in the dark, with Kanawha County having the most at a little more than 37,000. Wissing says they're thankful the weather cooperated today so the number of outages has gone down but she asks for patience while crews continue to work and we're seeing just so many trees down the the tree damage is extensive where it's brought down so much equipment poles it, it, you name it unfortunately a tree has probably come in contact with it due to the high winds I mean, uh, hunting... now here's some safety tips from Kanawha County's Facebook page some of this might be common knowledge Unplug your electrics and appliances to avoid any damage from electrical searches. Keep your generators outdoors and don't touch down power lines. As Wissing says, report anything that doesn't look normal if a power line is down or if a transformer is on the ground. And if you're still without power, the First Baptist Church of Nitro is opening its doors from now until 7 for people to charge their phones. You do have to bring your charger and they're also offering free dinner. For now, live in Charleston, Gina Marini, Eyewitness News. Back to you, Dave. All right, thank you, Gina. And 12 years ago, we had that ratio, and it was so humid, so hot, and people didn't have power. It's almost like we're turning to 180 because we're expecting some really cold temperatures, and we still have thousands of people in the dark. Yeah, I mean, dropping into the 30s here later on tonight, and maybe even some 20s by this upcoming weekend. So, you know, colder weather is ahead. Tomorrow's going to be a lot nastier than today. Today hasn't been that bad. I mean, it's much cooler than yesterday, but it's also a lot calmer in terms of severe weather. Temperatures are in the 50s, some 40s showing up out west, but we can manage that with the sun out. And we're actually seeing a little bit more sun breaking out right now. However, that's actually helping to fuel a few scattered showers, too. And we're going to see an uptick in those as well. We've had mainly dry weather for a while. Now we're starting to see some showers on the increase. One little batch is kind of falling apart across Putnam County, but a little bit of rain moving back into Huntington. So far, these aren't remarkable. But late evening... Could see a couple of these produce a little lightning, maybe even some small hail. Nothing severe, but you might get a little gust of wind as a shower pushes on through. Temperatures will start falling through the 40s, and eventually we're going to end up in the 30s overnight. We might even start mixing in some wet snowflakes towards dawn, 37 degrees. The mountains definitely are going to be seeing some snow. And in the highest spots, they're going to be accumulating some snow in the coming days. The other focus, though, 
the rains of yesterday resulting in flooding today. In particular, Eastern Meigs County, a flood warning remains in effect. The Shade River, it has dropped a little bit from its peak, but it's falling only very slowly right now as it's backing up with the Ohio River rising. We also have Sims Creek over there in Lawrence County. That is slowly rising as well. So there are still plenty of high water spots there. Gallia, Lawrence, Meigs County. Plus, we have the Ohio River. This is going to be the story in the coming days. Flood warnings along the Ohio River, basically from north of the RC uh, Bird Lock. And that's going to be where we're watching, especially Point Pleasant North. Moderate to even major flooding is going to be possible by the end of this week, start of the weekend. Could be seeing levels similar to 2018 in some communities like Pomeroy. And that's a big deal. So we're going to break all that down for you. Talk about the weather ahead for the upcoming weekend, too, in just a bit. All right, thank you, Doug. Well, a small area in Fayette County hit hard by a possible tornado. Anna Saunders takes us to the community of La Vista as those in the storm's path question where they should even begin. Yeah, here in the La Vista area of Fayette County, it's hard to put the devastation into words. I've talked to people today who say these are like scenes you would expect in a place like Oklahoma or Kansas, never something they expected to see in West Virginia. The devastation is all around on this small stretch of Route 60. Homes destroyed and knocked off foundations. A gas station also destroyed. Only three people had minor injuries, but an estimated 13 homes were damaged and destroyed. The National Weather Service will be out to survey the damage on Thursday and will confirm whether or not this was a tornado. Those who lived through it say there is just no other way to describe what they witnessed and stuff started flying by so we started through the house and that's when the roof come off and the ceiling collapsed on my husband and hit him in the head but he's okay and by then the storm was over so it just happened so just that fast can you even think about like the sounds you remember yes I, the, I when i was out i opened the door and i heard whoo whoo like a it wasn't it didn't sound like a train to me like everybody it just like woo 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 and i said what is that and then i could hear start glass the windows breaking the wind was blowing in the house and we was running with her down like that and then it was gone the Midland Trail Community Center serving as a shelter for people to stay and the Nuttall Fire Department is the staging area for volunteers and hot meals. Now, a lot of the people around here are staying with family, but as we mentioned, there is that shelter open at the Midland Trail Community Center. In Fayette County, Anna Saunders, Eyewitness News. All right, thank you, Anna. You know, many people are cleaning up after yesterday's storm created a path of damage through Kanawha County. Well, Daniel Burbank is live in Cross Lanes near the epicenter of all that damage. And Daniel, what are you seeing from your perspective right now? actually move back here. Sorry about that, Dave. I just noticed this tree is uh, not secured, so I'm actually going to back up here just a moment. This is the uh, thing that we are dealing with here because the winds picked up. This is the tree that we were a little concerned about. I'm noticing that uh, Colton, if you want to pan over there, the, these two already fell yesterday in the wind. We just backed up a little bit because this tree looks like it could pull up or fall or shift at any moment. So we're now a safe distance away. But if you want to pan a little bit to the right over there, this is one of the very large trees that we have seen. Now, Dave, the biggest difference between yesterday and today is the temperature. It's a lot cooler today. And that's a concern going into another night without power. Now, we're here at the Carlton Court Apartments. I've personally witnessed at least a few dozen downed trees. Now we're hearing there could be as many as 75 down trees in this area. Carlton Court has around 13 buildings and trees are laying across several of them. Residents telling me they do not have power and AAP's power map predicts the people won't have the lights back on until 11 p.m. Thursday night. Now residents say they noticed the lights start to flicker yesterday morning. They rush to their bathtubs, close the blinds. Uh, one tenant describes the sound like a whistling train, but as quick as this storm arrived, it was gone, leaving with it a path of damage. It was really quiet and then there was some rain and a little bit of wind and then a little bit more wind, more wind, more wind. Eventually it ended up sounding like a train happened to just turn its engine off and just barreling down right beside you. It's a day people here and across the state won't soon forget. One neighbor telling me she's sad 
not only for people's homes being destroyed, but the bird's nest that she takes care of. Now, she adds after living here for more than 20 years, people will come together. They will help each other like they always do. And just so our control room knows, we're even further away from the trees. So there's there's no danger for our crew uh, out here and the trees leaning. So it doesn't look like it could hit anyone's house here. Now, uh, the city of Charleston does have a new online form that they launched uh, that uh, allows people to uh, submit where there's damage. Now, it is important to note that this is not an application for any aid or assistance. This is just so the city can keep a catalog of where the damage is, what they need to know, and, and make decisions uh, to go from there. For now, live in Kanawha County, Daniel Burbank, Eyewitness News. Dave? All right, Daniel, thank you. And if you would like to fill out one of those surveys Daniel just mentioned, here's how you can fill out one of them. It's really simple. See the QR code here on your screen? That will take you directly to the survey. And if you're taking the survey, you'll want to have photos of the damage. Now, if you don't have access to the Internet, you can call the number below the QR label. It's right here. You can report the damage, 304-357-0570. Now, that's the Kanawha County Planning and Development phone number. The Kanawha County Commission is also telling people to contact their private insurance about coverage. And the end of the work week could see some major flooding in the Pomeroy, Ohio area and moderate flooding near Point Pleasant from a rain-swollen Ohio River. Eyewitness News reporter Bob Barron says that area at risk was still dealing with flooding from creeks, streams, and rivers that feed right into the Ohio River today. The weather focus is shifting to the Ohio River in Wheeling, Moundsville, Marietta, Pomeroy, and Point Pleasant. The massive amount of rain that fell locally and elsewhere was draining into the Ohio even as some small creeks and streams continue to cause their own flooding issues Wednesday in Meigs County, Gallia County, and elsewhere. All this water that's blocking Locust Grove Road is trying to make its way into the Shade River and will eventually end up in the Ohio where it will add to potential flood problems. The Ohio River forecast shows a major flood threat for Pomeroy and the Racine Locks and a moderate one for Point Pleasant. And yeah, we watch it a lot, yeah. And we were just over the community center and uh, they were talking about that it might be coming up into the streets. So I just come by and checked and it's already came up quite a bit. The downtown riverfront parking lot floods fairly frequently, but it's unusual to see floodwaters cover the street or to make it into downtown businesses. It looks like the river will crest late Thursday in Pomeroy and on Friday in Point Pleasant, about five feet above minor flood stage at both locations. In Pomeroy, Ohio, Bob Aaron, Eyewitness News. All right, thank you, Bob. Well, two people arrested in Jackson County after a fatal overdose investigation. Now, according to the sheriff's office, Cody Lee Miller and Carlina Pennington are both charged with drug delivery resulting in death and conspiracy to deliver fentanyl. All this after a fatal overdose in Ravenswood last week. Both are being held on a $150,000 bond. And a woman dies after a fire in Sissonville. It happened along Tahoe Road just after 9 o'clock last night. The state fire marshal tells us a 52-year-old woman died and a man had to go to the hospital with injuries. Now, the cause of the fire is still being investigated, but we will update you as we learn more. Also, a man accused of murdering a woman whose body was later found in a well in Sissonville has his trial pushed back again. Michael Smith is charged with first-degree murder for the death of Cheyenne Johnson back in 2021. Now, there have been several issues in the case that have led to numerous delays. The most recent deals with grand jury testimony. His co-defendant, Virginia Smith, has already pleaded guilty for her role in the crime. The earliest he could see a jury, August. It's an exciting day on Marshall University's campus. Here's why. You know, it was announced last week that Cornelius Jackson would be the new head men's basketball coach. Well, it wasn't until today that the Oak Hill native was officially introduced. Jackson played for the Thundering Herd from 1998 to 2001 under Greg White and has spent the past seven seasons serving as an assistant to Dan D'Antoni. Wow. Dreams do come true. Dreams do come true. This is a moment that I've dreamt of since uh, I was a 19-year-old kid sitting in Twin Towers East. And now I have the honor to stand before you as the head coach of Marshall University basketball team. How about that? 
Yeah, how about that? Well, we will have more on Cornelius Jackson's press conference later in the evening on Eyewitness News. And could the next catastrophe in the U.S. be its debt? We're taking a look at the growing national debt and why there may not be any solution to stop it. That's next. Well, America can't keep racking up the debt. Now, that is the warning from a growing number of experts and economists who say they hope to avoid a catastrophe. Well, tonight, Matt Galco reports for us. The warning signs are dire. The U.S. needs to get spending and debt under control or pay the price. Our debt is the size of the entire economy today. It's approaching a new record. The national debt sits at just over $34.5 trillion. That's an increase of about $3 trillion in the past year and almost $10 trillion in the past four years. The Congressional Budget Office forecasting it could balloon to $54 trillion over the next decade. Top economists, including Wharton School of Business Vice Dean Dr. Joao Gomez, recently warned lawmakers the unsustainable debt could be catastrophic for the country. Its consequences will be severe and leave lasting and probably irreversible scars on our economy and society. Gomez's warnings included the potential for a recession, a spike in interest rates as the value of the dollar plummets, and further inflation pain affecting all corners of the country. Bloomberg Economics released the results of one million simulations on the debt outlook. 88% of them showed the U.S. on an unsustainable path. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell brought up the issue earlier this year. The U.S. is on an unsustainable fiscal path. The U.S. federal government's on an unsustainable fiscal path. And that just means that the debt is growing faster than the economy. The debt to GDP ratio could swell to levels not seen since World War II and beyond in the next five years. Inaction could trigger a financial crisis. Let me put it this way. This year, we are projected to spend more on interest on the debt than everything we spend on defense or on Medicare. Think about that. The same economists predicting a catastrophe also say it's not too late to avoid one. One plan has a $400 billion cut spread out over a few years, staving off a potential financial crisis. But that's asking an awful lot from a bitterly divided Congress that's routinely scrambling to fund the government. In Washington, I'm Matt Galka. All right. Thank you, Matt. Well, giving us an the weather is not giving us an easy out for the weekend. You know, we're taking a look at which communities should be preparing for some possible flooding with Doug Harlow on the other side of the break.
Well, whether or not yesterday was officially a derecho remains to be seen. They'll kind of reinvestigate it and classify it as such. It probably was. But it was certainly every bit as strong as the one in 2012. Maybe a little bit more limited in scope. But the maximum gust out of that 2012 derecho in summertime, 91 miles an hour up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We had a gust of 78 miles an hour at Yeager Airport, 68 in Beckley, 62 Cal Police, and 59 in Huntington. The max gust out of this event was in our own area, and it was 102, Boyd County Emergency Operations Center. But even Tri-State Airport Huntington beat out Fort Wayne by a mile, 92 mile an hour gust clock there. Yeager Airport's gusts, at least the Yeager Airport's gusts were less than the uh, duratio, but I think the damage around the Kanawha Valley is worse this time around. So that may not have been representative of what happened elsewhere. And I mean, frequent gusts you know, elsewhere, at least about 50 miles an hour. So all that's gone. Now we're just dealing with some scattered showers. If you've got some sun out right now, it's not too bad. If you've got a shower, eh, it's not so great. It's clouded over and it's raining. Conditions are changing quickly. Actually, this is the kind of weather that produces rainbows, so keep an eye out for that. We've got a little shower sneaking towards downtown Charleston right now. Very small in scope. Then that will move out. The sun will come back out. And then here's another shower. We've got one around Huntington. We're going to just kind of repeat this process through the evening, so keep an umbrella on hand. Most of this is manageable. A little heavier shower around Paintsville right now. We've got a little downpour near Williamson, and we're seeing a little bit of lightning east of Lexington. With the sun breaking out, a couple of these showers could produce a bit of lightning, maybe some small hail, nothing severe though, but it will get, you know, unsettled through the evening. And yeah, there's our culprit. That low pressure center hasn't moved much over the last 24 hours. Now a front did come through this morning. The severe weather's east of the front, but we've got this broad northwesterly flow bringing in this colder weather and a lot of showers. We're actually going to be seeing a big uptick in those for tomorrow. They're not going to cause any additional flooding. Our problems stem from the rain that's already fallen with some of those smaller streams and creeks. And the Ohio River, the problem is what fell up in Pittsburgh and eastern Ohio. This zone right up in here over the last several days has seen upwards of a half foot of rain. All that's coming downstream. That's why we're concerned about the Ohio River, not so much because of the rain we've had here, but because of what fell up north. And that's why they're predicting that Racine and Pomeroy late Thursday into Friday will likely be approaching or exceeding major flood stage. Very similar levels expected there to 2018. That was a devastating flood for the Pomeroy area, and that's why we're so concerned about that. As you get further downstream, because we didn't have as much rain, it's lesser impacts. So Point Pleasant, it's expected to crest sometime Friday afternoon, moderate flood stage. And by the time you get down to Huntington, it'll probably crest this Saturday right around flood stage. So we'll have some backwater issues for sure. But I think the biggest concern flood wise with that event would tend to be from Point Pleasant northward up toward Parkersburg. So for this evening, we've got these scattered showers and yeah, we could see a little small hail out of a couple of these cells. They'll tend to diminish for a time overnight before picking up toward dawn. And at that point, a lot of us are falling into the 30s, a little sleet and wet snow might be mixing in and tomorrow we could have all kinds of precipitation types, mostly rain showers in the valleys, but some sleet can mix in at times in the mountains. It'll be snow. Temps are only in the 40s. So if you thought today was cool, tomorrow is going to be nasty. In fact, in the mountains, yeah, the snow will accumulate. We've got winter storm warnings in effect here. Eastern Webster County on up through Pocahontas, Randolph, Greenbrier counties. I could see six inches plus above 4,000 feet, but even Route 19 might get a little grassy dusting that can melt off here at times. So very cold next couple of days. Not very nice. The weekend will start to improve, especially Sunday. I think it's still kind of chilly and cloudy Saturday, but we'll hit 60 Sunday. Might warm to 70 Monday, but with a scattered shower chance, we'll keep an eye on that for the solar eclipse forecast. All right, thank you, Doug. Well, just days after a man got H1N1 from a cow in Texas, bird flu causing the largest fresh egg producer in the U.S. to take drastic measures. We'll talk about that coming up.
And welcome back. You know, the largest fresh egg producer in the country is shutting down a plant in Texas. This after the bird flu is found in a flock of chickens. Now, all this happened after a Texas man got sick with H1N1 from contact with a cow. Well, as Tim Pulliam tells us, there are at least 11 confirmed cases across the country in cattle. Cow Maine Foods, the largest producer of fresh eggs in the U.S., says chickens at its Texas plant tested positive for bird flu. The Mississippi-based company says it destroyed about 3.6 percent of its total flock, including 1.6 million egg-laying hens after the discovery at their facility in Palmer County, Texas. The company saying in a statement it's working with federal, state, and local leaders to mitigate the risk of future outbreaks while ramping up production at other sites to minimize disruption to his customers. Sick birds were also found at Herbrook's poultry ranch in Michigan. The company says the facility is being disinfected and sick flock has been separated. What we need to know most is that this is a relatively low risk to the general population and it's incredibly contagious between animals. And now that we have this human case here in the United States, uh, senses and, and precautions have been heightened. The case comes just days after state health officials said a person was infected with mild symptoms of bird flu following contact with cows. The patient reported something called conjunctivitis, which often includes redness or itchiness of the eyes. And the symptoms of this influenza can be very similar to the typical influenza that we see. The mammal to human case marks the first known case in the U.S. of this version of bird flu, according to federal health officials. The CDC says there is no evidence of human to human transmission and the virus has not adapted or changed to infect a human. The CDC has said the risk uh, to human health uh, from this outbreak is low. Uh, they are continuing to monitor and will continue to coordinate with relevant agencies and officials. This is when it comes again, when it comes to the public health of the American people, we take that very seriously and we'll continue to track this. According to the USDA, there are at least 11 positive cases in cows nationwide. This includes cattle in Texas, New Mexico, Kansas and Michigan. Tim Pulliam, ABC News, Los Angeles. All right, thank you, Tim. And coming up, as we check the damage here in our own backyard, we're going to head west to see what the storm left behind in Ohio and Kentucky right after this quick break.
Eyewitness News at 5.30 starts right now. Well, much different weather on this third day of April compared to the second day. Certainly uh, much quieter overall. Not completely quiet. We've got a couple showers out there. We've got some sun. We've got some clouds and maybe the two together with some raindrops. Might see some rainbows out there. Keep an eye out for that. Right now in Charleston, we've got a few light raindrops coming down, but still some sun shining, so that's certainly a possibility. It's not 70 degrees anymore, and you know what? That's a good thing because that means no severe thunderstorms. We're in the 50s. When the sun's out, not too bad. It's a little breezy, but then it clouds over and you start getting some rain, and it's not so pleasant. And we're going to have these waves of showers pushing through here for this evening, so keep an umbrella on hand. The weather can change very quickly going from sunshine and decent conditions to kind of cold and rainy for a time. These are brief showers, though, moving through. Not seeing much lightning on them right now. Can't rule that out, though. Perhaps some little small hail in a couple of these cells as we head throughout the evening. But temperatures will be getting colder into the overnight, falling through the 40s, eventually 30s. And we could be waking up to rain, some sleet showers, some snow showers, especially in the higher spots. Eh, tomorrow is going to be a nasty day. Today, kind of transitioning that way. We still have flooding ongoing. Shade River slowly dropping, but only slowly. We also have Sims Creek running high, so Lawrence, Gallia County, Meigs County still under a flood warning. But the main thing we're watching, the Ohio River, which is rising, and it's going to continue to rise over the next couple of days. And this could become a major issue for some communities, especially north of Point Pleasant. I'm thinking the Pomeroy area right now, forecast to reach major flood stage by late Thursday and Friday. We're going to take a closer look at that and also your week's uh, forecast ahead, of course, the weekend, and solar eclipse Monday, too, in just a bit. And the National Weather Service is checking out storm damage in southern Ohio. Gil McClanahan reports tonight from Hanging Rock. As far as cleanup goes, people who live in this section of Lawrence County, Ohio, tell me the damage is so extensive and overwhelming, they don't know where to begin. Campers on their side. This video shot by Mindy Broughton shows the aftermath of the storm that seemed to last just a few seconds. Her video has gone viral with millions of views. I thought we were going to die. I thought about my kids, my grandbaby. And I also thought, because we were holding each other really tight, I, I, in my mind, I was, I was thinking, if we get blown out of here, I hope the wind doesn't rip us apart. It picked it up. It blew the roof off. All the windows blew out, ripped all the anchors up. Sen Rusk says she, her brothers, and a friend were all hunkered down in the living room, and the wind picked up their mobile home and slammed it to the ground. It's six, six feet off the ground because of flooding. My younger brother tried to hold the screen door. The wind was just too, too much, so he kicked the door closed. We could feel the floor start to feel like a snake under. A nearby bar had the roof blown off, and campers in a campground were either flipped on their side or destroyed. Uh, this is probably the worst damage we've seen in Lawrence County. Tony Edwards with the National Weather Service in Charleston and his team were in Lawrence County today to survey the damage. You know, 90 mile an hour winds is, is going to do a lot of damage whether it's tornadic or not. Uh, and what we come out and look for is any kind of signs of rotation or convergence in the pattern that would indicate a tornado. People who live in this area tell me that people have been stopping by to check on them to see if they need anything. In Lawrence County, Ohio, Gil McClanahan, Eyewitness News. All right, Gil, thank you. And the National Weather Service surveyed damage in seven counties in the tri-state area. Well, Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir addressed the Commonwealth today and confirmed the worst. One person sadly died in Cabell County, Campbell County, that is. Bashir said it happened when a line of harsh rain and wind caused a car to crash. And the governor says there are no other serious injuries to report. The National Weather Service confirmed several EF1 tornadoes in Kentucky. One clocked in at 110 miles per hour. The governor says there could have been as many as seven tornadoes that touched down. Uh, if I had a concern going into this, it's just that we face so much that, that people might um, not react with the care and, and the need uh, that is required. But, but Kentuckians showed they continue to be weather aware. And we've learned some, some tough lessons over the last several years. So. And Bashir confirmed 18 counties in Kentucky, along with a state of emergency. There are also 12 county declarations, including Boyd, Elliott, and Greenup counties.
And now on to the 2024 presidential campaign. Former President Donald Trump back on the trail for the first time in more than two weeks, this time focusing on baseless claims of migrant crime. Meanwhile, President Biden and his campaign are firing back. Ike Jachi has the latest in Washington. For the first time in over two weeks, former President Trump back on the campaign trail in the critical swing states of Michigan and Wisconsin. Trump's campaign schedule has been light, complicated by his legal issues. But now he's back on and focusing on what he's now calling migrant crime. Trump promising to launch the largest deportation operation, ramping up his attacks against President Biden, accusing him of unleashing a bloodbath at the border. Joe Biden's Border bloodbath. Remember, they used the name bloodbath. I was talking about something entirely different, but this is a border bloodbath. Ends the day I take the oath of office. It ends. President Biden continuing to ramp up his attacks against Trump, highlighting their stark differences on key issues he feels are the cornerstones of democracy, including Trump's stance on abortion. The Biden campaign celebrating a court ruling that will add an abortion rights measure to the November ballot in Florida. And on Wednesday, during a White House event focusing on health care, Biden taking a few swipes at his predecessor and slamming Republicans for wanting to terminate the Affordable Care Act. They want to terminate the Affordable Care Act. I love it. Terminate. My, uh, as my predecessor says, kicking millions of Americans off their health insurance. Kamala and I are protecting and expanding the Affordable Health Care Act, known as Obamacare, which I might add is still a big deal. Now, during the White House event, President Biden repeated his call for the $2,000 out-of-pocket cap on prescription drugs to be applied to all Americans. Ike Jachi, ABC News, Washington. It's your voice, your future. We are quickly approaching the West Virginia primary election. And Eyewitness News will stream a debate between the West Virginia GOP candidates for Attorney General, brought to you by Council Connections. Just scan the QR code right here on your screen to subscribe and get notified when the debate starts. We'll be streaming it on our YouTube and Facebook pages, and Kenny Bass will moderate the discussion between Mike Stewart and J.B. McCuskey on April 8th at 7 p.m. We hope you join us. We've been talking about the total solar eclipse now for months, but believe it or not, a new survey says many of us still don't know the best way to protect our eyes. I'm Liz Bonus. We'll share details just ahead. Eyewitness News Guide Team is sponsored by GoMart.
You know, next Monday is the historic solar eclipse, and it appears there's a lot of misinformation about its impact on our health. Liz Bonus explains why. Hey there, everybody. We've been talking about the solar eclipse now for months, but a new survey shows at least one out of every three of us still don't know the health risks of it. The survey conducted by the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, which provided this video, found 30% of those asked didn't know looking at a solar eclipse without proper eye protection can cause permanent eye damage. When it comes to total solar eclipse, uh, even though the sun is going to be mostly blocked, uh, there are still UV rays coming down, and so if you look directly into them, it can damage your retina. Your retina is the light-sensitive layer of tissue at the back of the eyeball. Dr. Yao Jin of Miami University of Ohio says that can lead to what you see looking like this. It dims the central vision. Dr. Jin says it's one of the reasons eclipse glasses with this seal of approval from an approved vendor are needed to view the eclipse. A lot of uh, counterfeits are floating around. And if you happen to accidentally buy one of the counterfeits, you would not be able to tell that they're counterfeits. And when you put them on and look at the sun, they will offer little to no protection. And you might actually end up with uh, the solar eclipse burned onto your retina. That means you would see sort of permanent blind spots. After polling more than 1,000 Americans, the survey also found more than 10% believe an eclipse can cause natural disasters, sleep problems, and mental health issues. There's no evidence, however, linking any of these health concerns to the eclipse. The only weather change expected, according to NOAA, is a drop in temperature while the sun is concealed by the moon. Now, one other thing I've been asked several times is why can't I just wear my own sunglasses for proper eye protection? No matter how dark they may look, they do not meet the standards to protect your eyes in this eclipse. With your health news, I'm Liz Bonus reporting. All right, thank you, Liz. Well, it's the risk of flooding as we head into the second half of the week. Doug Harlow is looking at your extended forecast on the other side of the break. Well, we have a weather alert up here all the way through Saturday, but this is for folks along the Ohio River and the tributaries flowing into it for backwater issues. Because, yeah, the Ohio River is going to be the focus in terms of any major problems in the next couple of days, especially Point Pleasant North. I don't think the crest will be as dramatic further south. There will be some flooding backwater flooding around the Huntington area by this weekend for sure, but uh, it's kind of what we see typically once every year or so. 
But around Point Pleasant, moderate flooding, and then north of there, Pomeroy, unfortunately, at least for right now, the official forecast is for a crest that is actually above 2018. Now, that's a forecast that can change. It could come in a little lower, but you kind of get the picture in terms of what the National Weather Service and the hydrologists are thinking in terms of you know what this would compare to. The 2018 February flood in Pomeroy, that was bad cause a lot of problems for businesses along Main Street. So that's what we're watching out for here. Racine also expected to get up near that 2018 level as well. I know a lot of homes were surrounded by water with that one. Point Pleasant, moderate flooding. There'll definitely be backwater issues around the Henderson area, places like that. Uh, probably not going to be as high as 2018 for the Point Pleasant area because the Kanawha River is not that high. And all other rivers, you know, Cole, Guyandot, I mean, yeah, some of them are running a little high. We just had some rain. But there's no problems expected. It's only the Ohio that we're really watching out for. And some of those tributaries flowing into it will have backwater issues. Temps right now. 40s, 50s, it was 54 in Charleston about five minutes ago. It may be 48 now. <laughs> we just had a downpour. It is 40s and even 30s to our northwest. And believe it or not, colder weather is settling in here later tonight and tomorrow. We've got a couple showers out there right now. Very changeable forecast this evening. Charleston, we were just enjoying some sun. Now we just had a downpour. Now the sun's about to come out. So this is rainbow kind of weather with these little quick hitting showers moving through. None of them are severe. There's a little lightning strike south of Hamlin. These could produce some tiny hail pellets, so don't be shocked if you see that. But, you know, maybe a gust of wind, 30, 35 miles an hour. That's about the extent of it. But you can see some of these showers pushing east. One's about to move into Logan. It'll come and go, and then the sun will come back out until the sun sets. But we'll continue to see some of these scattered showers pushing on through here through the remainder of this evening. Now, overnight, I think we'll start seeing more showers towards dawn. Some sleet might even mix in, some wet snowflakes. Temps start off in the 30s tomorrow. We're not going to get much warmer. And I think the coverage of showers, unlike today where we were mostly dry midday, and we had some sun, it hasn't been all bad. Tomorrow, uh, yeah, it's going to rain quite a bit. I think these showers will be much more frequent. Temperatures stuck in the 40s, so it's colder. It's blustery. In the mountains, it'll be snow. And in the highest spots, staying all snow and accumulating. Snowshoe Canaan Valley going to be seeing a good amount of snow with a winter storm warning. You know, but even Beckley, Fayetteville, Thursday night into Friday morning in particular, you could get a little grassy coating out there. The rest of us, Friday, unfortunately, doesn't look any better with more showers. Things will improve gradually this weekend. Sunday, the best day. We'll get up to about 60 in the afternoon with some sun. Then Monday, of course, that's the solar eclipse day. Could start off with some clouds and a shower. This is the latest forecast model for this day. Now, what gets interesting, the key time frame is 2 to 4 in the afternoon. We'll see it peaking as far as the, obscur uh, the uh, obscuring of the sun right around 3.15. On this latest model, right about 2 o'clock, we might see those clouds break. So fingers crossed. It's a little tricky. You'd expect it would be in April. <laughs> we generally don't tend to see sunny, beautiful, quiet days in April. So we'll watch that. Doesn't look like it's going to be a complete cloud cover day. So that's good. And it's also going to be warm. Temps will hit about 70 or better early next week. Probably starting uh, some rain shower chances, though, Tuesday and Wednesday. But for the next couple of days, pretty nasty. Rain showers, some sleet at times mixed in with snow in the mountains. Highs only in the 40s. Overnight lows, 30s and even 20s into the weekend, which is a concern for folks that don't have power. How Papa John's is helping out the Canal Charleston Humane Association. Right after this quick break.
Well, Papa John's Pizza is stepping up to help out the Canal Charleston Humane Association. Kenny Bass joins us from Papa John's in Canal City with details. Of course, we all know about the troubles at the Kanawha Charleston Animal Shelter with the U-Haul ramming into the building. As a part of Sinclair's Day of Service, we're helping out the Animal Shelter, and we've reached out to our friends, including the fine folks here at Papa John's. Joining me is Praveen Srinivasan, who runs the stores in West Virginia and other places throughout America. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for agreeing to help out the shelter. What do you have in mind? Uh, we want, uh, for now, we want all our Papa John's locations in the Kanak Valley to be a collection point for if you want to drop off food and any supplies that the animal shelter needs, we'll be glad to take them. And also in re return, we'll give a free bread side for all the troubles and everything that you're going to go through to come to our location. You can use it anytime online in the future. And you, you're talking about uh, in perpetuity because the animal shelter always has needs and the demand is always there. You're going to do something else on your website. Absolutely. I was talking to Kat, my general manager here. She said when I got to know about what happened at the animal shelter, she said I just wanted to go adopt all the dogs. <laughs> so that's what everybody's feeling in this uh, community. So what we want to do is we want to give 20% back. We're going to set up a coupon online. And this is going to be an ongoing thing. It's going to be a relationship with the animal shelter and, of course, with WCHS as well, where we'll donate 20% of our sales from a particular coupon uh, to go to the animal shelter for all the needs that they have throughout the year. Because it, the need is ongoing, and uh, the, you know we just want to be a part of it. Ravine Srinivasan with Papa John. So a coupon is coming where you can have 20% of the sale donated to the shelter. And right now, you can drop off supplies, food, cleaning supplies, whatever the shelter usually needs needs at one of the four locations in Kanawha County here in Kanawha City, also at Patrick Street, Cross Lane, St. Albans. Oh, I've been to all of them, man. I know exactly where they are. <laughs> Thank you, Praveen, very much for your help. Thank you, Kenny. Appreciate it, and we're glad to be a part of this community. So help out the animal shelter. Help yourself get some great pizza here at Papa John's. Reporting from the Papa John's in Kanawha City, Kenny Bass, Eyewitness News. All right, thank you, Kenny. And as Kenny said, don't forget to look on the Papa John's website for a coupon where the company will donate 20% of your pizza purchase and it will go straight to the shelter. Also, if you want to help in a different way, just scan the QR code here on your screen. It will take you to a list of different ways how you can help out. Donations can be dropped off here at our Charleston studio also through next Tuesday, which is April 9th. And just ahead, a small community in Fayette County assessing the damage after a possible tornado yesterday. How they're handling the aftermath next. Hi, Dave. As you can see over my shoulder, there are a couple of uh, I don't know. I haven't heard Graham yet. Okay. Yeah, we're still, we're just... ...that phone. I have no, yes, I can hear you. The only communication.
Well, thousands of people still have no power in their homes and some completely destroyed in the severe weather that happened. We have the very latest in a live report for you. And the focus weather-wise shifting from severe thunderstorms to colder temperatures and Ohio River flooding. I'll have the latest on that coming up. Eyewitness News at 6 starts right now. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight here on Eyewitness News. Doug, it has been a crazy 24 hours and a lot of cleanup going on right now as we speak. But it's not all over because now there's talk of flooding. Yeah, for the Ohio River, uh, that's what we're watching here. We have some residual flooding in counties bordering the Ohio River mm -hmm. as well from last night's rains. Although the biggest problem is not the rains from around here. It's from rains that fell up in Pittsburgh with this event. They didn't have the severe weather. They had torrential rainfall, and all that's going to be working down the Ohio River. What we're getting here this evening and for tomorrow is showers not going to add to any flood woes. In fact, it's kind of strange out there. This is rainbow weather. Literally, we have one in Charleston right now. We had a quick shower about 15 minutes ago. Now the sun's back out and there is a rainbow over downtown Charleston, so it's looking nice. It's a lot cooler. It's no longer 70 degrees. It's 49 to about 52 out there. So yes, much cooler weather. When the sun's out, though, it's not all bad. A little breezy, but keep an umbrella on hand. We're going to see these frequent little showers pushing through. They don't last too long. One had a little lightning down in Lincoln County, but nothing severe. At worst, maybe some pea-sized hail could come out of these cells as they pass by. So they'll just be scattered around the area through this evening. Overnight, we'll fall into the 30s, and by dawn tomorrow, we might even have some sleet or some wet snowflakes mixed in with those raindrops. And there's going to be a lot more showers for tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a much nastier day than today. We still have flood warnings up for Lawrence County, Ohio, Gallia County, Eastern Meigs. That's the Shade River, which is dropping a little bit, but only very slowly. So still in flood stage there. So is Sims Creek, which is actually slowly rising. So those are problem spots right now. But eventually it's the Ohio River. All that water flowing into that, plus a lot of water coming downstream here from the north. So the Ohio River is going to be experiencing flooding. Now, some spots, it'll only be minor flooding, like Huntington by the weekend. But I think from Point Pleasant and especially north of there, the Pomeroy area, they're forecasting moderate to major flooding, similar levels to what we had back in 2018 in February. And that was a significant flood for the Pomeroy area. So we're going weather alert for the Ohio River. Other rivers are fine. Kanaw, Cole, Guyandot, no problems there. It's the Ohio River that's going to be the focus into the weekend. And we'll track that for you and, of course, talk about weather conditions expected around here for the weekend and for Solar Eclipse Monday in just a bit. And the storm's causing thousands of customers all across West Virginia to go dark. And tonight we have team coverage with Gina Marini and Daniel Burbank as that recovery begins. But first, let's start with Gina Marini, who has the very latest on restoration efforts, and she's standing by in the Coles parking lot, surrounded by bucket trucks. So, Gina, what are you seeing right now? Hi, Dave. As you can see right now over my shoulder, there are a couple of bucket trucks here. I'm going to step out of the way so you can actually get a better look. We posted a short while ago on X. We shared a photo that showed how many trucks there were here. Well, that number has gone down, which is a good thing because it means crews are out working. I spoke with Appalachian Power just a short while ago. They tell me there are a little more than 2,200 crews working, with a little more than 2,100 of those coming from st out of state. Now, some of those crews coming as far away as Indiana and Missouri. Kara Wissing from Appalachian Power says at the peak of the storm, about 125,000 customers were without power. I just checked the outage map. Right now, it's showing there's about 70,000 customers still in the dark, with Kanawha County having the most at a little more than 36,000. Wissing says they're thankful the weather cooperated today, so the number of outages has gone down, but asks for patience while crews continue to work. Just stay safe, and that, that means staying away from any down power lines, maybe any trees. If it doesn't look normal, say it's a transformers on the ground, it, anything that just looks off, we ask that you please report it because those hazards in the field, it could hurt someone of the public or even our employees, so we want to make sure we know of all of those. 
And here's some safety tips from Kanawha County's Facebook page. Some of this might be common knowledge, but unplug your electronics and appliances to avoid any damage from electrical surges. Keep your generators outdoors and don't touch power lines. And as Wissing just said, report anything that doesn't look normal if the power lines are down or you come across a transformer that's on the ground. Now, right now, if your phone is, is in need charged or you don't have any power, you can head to the First Baptist Church of Nitro. They've opened their doors and they're staying open until about 7 so you can charge your phones. You do need to bring your own charging cord and they are offering free dinner. For now, live in Charleston, Gina Marini, I win. All right, thank you, Gina. Well, the cleanup continues, especially here in Kanawha County. Daniel Burbank joins us live in Cross Lanes near the epicenter. Daniel, paint the picture for us. Well, I think it's important to also note that we are having tremendous difficulty with cellular communication. So I'm actually talking to you uh, via satellite at the moment. That's the only way that, that, that I'm able to hear the broadcast. And that's been an issue that has been happening since this storm happened here, not only taking out some cellular communications, but power, as we just heard here. But the more dramatic scene is off to over here where you're able to see the amount of trees that are down here. Uh, now we're at the Carlton Apartments and I'm told that there's about 13 buildings with trees laying across quite a few of them. The biggest difference, Dave, between yesterday and today is the temperature. Uh, it's a lot cooler today. There's a concern going into the night, obviously with power. Now uh, we're been to, we've been told that there could be as many as 75 trees that are down. I've personally seen at least a dozen. Now, residents telling us they don't have power. AEP predicts that this area won't have the lights back on until 11.50 p.m. Thursday night, 11 p.m. rather. A residents say they noticed the lights started to flicker yesterday, rushed to their bathrooms, closed the blinds. One tenant describes that it sounded like a whistling train, but as quick as the storm arrived, it was gone, leaving with it a path of damage. It was really quiet, and then... There was some rain and a little bit of wind and then a little bit more wind, more wind, more wind. Eventually it ended up sounding like a train happened to just turn its engine off and just barreling down right beside you. It's a day people here won't soon forget. One neighbor tells me that they're sad not for not only for the people's homes that were destroyed, but the bird nests that she takes care of. Adding that after living here for more than 20 years, people will come together like they always do to help each other. Now, it's also important to note in the city of Charleston, there is an online link that actually just launched. It's a form where people can submit the damage that they're seeing at their property. It's also important to note that this is not a request for aid. It's more for the city to keep a catalog of exactly what they need to know because of how widespread this damage goes. For now, live in Kanawha County, Daniel Burbank, Eyewitness News. All right, thank you, Daniel. Good information there. Well, a small area in Fayette County hit hard by a possible tornado. Anna Saunders takes us to the community of La Vista as those in the storm's path question where to even begin. Yeah, here in the La Vista area of Fayette County, it's hard to put the devastation into words. I've talked to people today who say these are like scenes you would expect in a place like Oklahoma or Kansas, never something they expected to see in West Virginia. I don't know. I don't know where to even begin. I don't know where you even begin other than the insurance. <laughs> I guess we're, I know my sons are coming with saws. I don't know, just go in and try to find what I can find that I can put somewhere. Looking at the destruction of her house, Marla Cart and so many others in the La Vista area are looking at a long road ahead. This after a quick and terrifying experience with a possible tornado. And stuff started flying by, so we started through the house, and that's when the roof come off and the ceiling collapsed on my husband and hit him in the head, but he's okay. And by then the storm was over. According to emergency management officials, an estimated 13 homes were damaged or destroyed, but surveys are still being done. And the National Weather Service will be out on Thursday to possibly confirm a tornado. A shelter where people can stay, bathe, eat, and wash clothes now open at the Midland Trail Community Center. It's always bad when you have to open a disaster shelter, but it really hits home when it's people that you've watched grow up. 
The Nuttall Fire Department serving as a staging area for volunteers and hot meals. You know, there's a lot of folks that this volunteer and come over to help, you know, fix some meals for people. Uh, in this morning, uh, we got uh, some of the, trying to salvage some of the things out of their homes. Uh, there's probably realistically with the service department, friends, family, neighbors, 60, 70 people, um, you know, loading things into U-Hauls and, and trailers, taking it to either family members' houses or storage units and, you know, to what they can salvage. The community banding together always something to expect in a close-knit area like this but the storm itself not something anyone ever imagined in these hills you think fire or something like that but not a tornado <laughs> not of this not of this magnitude anyway now a lot of the people around here are staying with family but as we mentioned there is that shelter open at the Midland Trail Community Center in Fayette County Anna Saunders eyewitness news all right, Anna, thank you. Now, the Midland Trail Community Center is always taking donations of toiletries, and the main items needed right now by the fire department are tarps and trash bags as that colder weather and possibly snow move in. And we continue with our weather coverage, and we're going to look at areas hit the worst. And you're also going to hear from a family and their story of a near-death experience. Well, the National Weather Service is checking storm damage in Lawrence County, Ohio, and Gil McClanahan reports for us tonight from Hanging Rock. The National Weather Service says the winds that came through this area of Lawrence County, Ohio, were anywhere from 90 to 102 miles per hour. Those winds left a path of destruction. Those high winds left their mark on the Hanging Rock community of Lawrence County, Ohio. A nearby bar had the roof blown off and campers in a campground were either flipped onto their side or destroyed. It picked it up, it blew the roof off, all the windows blew out, ripped all the anchors up. Sid Rusk says she, her brothers and a friend were all hunkered down in the living room and the wind picked up their mobile home and slammed it to the ground. It sits six feet off the ground because of flooding. My younger brother tried to hold the screen door. The wind was just too, too much, so he kicked the door closed. We could feel the floor start to feel like a snake under. As far as cleanup goes, those living here in this area tell me the damage is so extensive and overwhelming, they don't know where to begin. In Lawrence County, Ohio, Gil McClanahan, Eyewitness News.
Well, we'll wait and see whether this gets officially classified as a derecho, the storm system that came through yesterday morning. But it's certainly compared to the one back in 2012. Maximum gusts from that one across all states was Fort Wayne, Indiana, 91 miles an hour. We gusted to 78 miles an hour in Yeager Airport with that event, 68 in Beckley, 59 for Huntington. Yesterday, we had a gust of 102 at the Boyd County Emergency Operations Center. So that beats out 2012 just right there. 92 mile an hour gust at the official airport site, Trice the Airport in Huntington, which also beats the Fort Wayne measurement from 12 years ago. Jaeger Airport officially gusted less than the duration back in 2012. But honestly, I think the damage in Kanawha County seems worse to me at least. So there were probably other spots that gusted higher than 60. Certainly with those signs coming down, that is more than a 60 mile an hour gust. All that's gone now. It's just about 20 degrees colder. And that's the story now, the chill. We've got a couple showers out there. We've got some rainbows. Very interesting afternoon. And honestly, today isn't too bad. Tomorrow, you're going to be thinking today felt balmy in comparison. It's going to be a lot nastier, unfortunately. Got a couple scattered showers out there, a few downpours. We had one move through Charleston, then the sun came out. We got that rainbow. It's quiet for now, but keeping an eye on a little downpour moving across Lincoln County. That might skirt at least downtown Charleston, certainly Southridge, and then down towards uh, maybe uh, Kanawha City, places like that. Couple showers moving out of Logan. Another one looks like it's going to move back into Logan. So keep the umbrellas on hand. These are fast moving. A couple lightning strikes, maybe some small hail, but nothing more than that. These aren't going to add to the flood woes either. They come and go, won't leave a lot of rain in their wake, but it can rain hard briefly along with a gust of wind. But this is all circulating around that big low pressure center, which really hasn't moved very much, but it's pinwheeling around all these clouds and showers. And see this stuff up here, it's a lot more concentrated. That's what's going to start moving in here for tomorrow. Rainfall totals, we got some for sure, but the problem with the Ohio River is this stuff. This is about a half foot of rain that fell up in the Pittsburgh, eastern Ohio area since back on Sunday night. All that water is coming down the Ohio River. So that's why, even though we haven't had a tremendous amount of rain around here, we're looking at the potential for a major flood event around the Pomeroy area and Racine. They're forecasted to get up to major flood stage here, or at least very close in Racine's right on the border of moderate to major. That would be late Thursday into Friday. Waters are already coming up there very quickly. So that's going to be a big concern. That's very similar to the 2018 flood in terms of impacts there. And that was a significant flood for the Pomeroy area. Now, as you get downstream, we don't have much contribution coming out of the Kanawha River, the Little Kanawha. So the Point Pleasant area, it'll be a moderate flood, not as high as 2018, though. And by the time you get down toward Huntington, probably looking at right about flood stage sometime late Friday or Saturday, there'll be backwater issues but it's a minor flood, more manageable and kind of your typical springtime flood there. So again, it's going to be that Point Pleasant north to Parkersburg zone that we're watching most carefully. These won't add any problems to that. The damage has already been done with the rain up north flowing south, but some scattered showers, maybe some small hail this evening. Temps will fall into the 30s by dawn tomorrow. Now we've got more widespread showers tomorrow morning, pretty much all day. And some of that pink, it's a little sleet. There could be some small hail, maybe a rumble of thunder. And in the mountains, yes, this will be snow. And you can basically take that forecast We're only in the lower 40s tomorrow afternoon. Same thing again on Friday. A couple of really unattractive days coming up here weather-wise. And in the mountains, yes, up at ski country, above 4,000 feet, a half foot or more snow. But even a little grassy dusting, maybe about an inch or so along Route 19, it'll probably melt off during the day but fall at night. It's still chilly into Saturday. Sunday's the better day. We get some sun out. We'll jump to 60 after a cold start in the 20s. And we could be around 70 on Monday, eclipse day. Fingers crossed we can clear out some early clouds and get the sun and a good view of that sun and the eclipse in the afternoon. Thank you, Doug. Well, it's said to be one of the prettiest places you'll ever find in West Virginia. Next in Wild Appalachia, we're heading to Canaan Valley and show you how the wildlife refuge is expanding and even helping places far away.
Eyewitness News Guide Team is sponsored by GoMart. Well, if you've been, you know. Canaan Valley is one of the most unique places you'll ever find in the Mountain State, and its wildlife refuge is now expanding. In this edition of Wild Appalachia, we learn its benefits to local wildlife, but also to places much further away. It's a little bit of Canada gone astray. That's how many describe the wetlands of Canade Valley in northeastern West Virginia. It's not so much the latitude, but it's the altitude and surrounding mountains that allows cold air to drain into the valley below. There's over 580 species of plants and animals in this area, 280 uh, species of mammals. There's also a flurry of migratory birds. Here at 3,200 feet, it can frost all months of the year, and you'll find plant life that should be in Canada. All of these are protected with Canaan Valley being a refuge. In 1994, it became the 500th of its kind in the United States. There are only two in West Virginia. Now you can learn more about Canaan Valley up close and personal at the new and improved Canaan Valley National Wildlife Refuge Visitor Center. With the help of Senator Manchin and Senator Capito, we have received $7 million in legacy funds. A, we need a new building. B, the Ecological Services and Office of Law Enforcement actually co-located here. Feel free to look around if you have questions and come talk to me. But we also needed an area for the public to know where they could come, where they could visit, as you see by the exhibits, show the video, and then point them in the right direction. Wanting to hike or fish in the area? These kiosks will show you the way. You can come in and say, hey, I want to spend four hours. Okay, you hit four hours and you're like, what do I want to do? Well, you want to hike. Once you do that, it shows you a number of trails that you can hike within that time frame. Hunt, it shows you that. Fish, it shows you that. It's pretty unique. The terrain map lets you know what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages in the area. And don't forget the new and improved boardwalk, especially striking in early fall. But wetlands clean pretty much the water. Yeah, they're like a sifter. Uh, because of our elevation, we're at the point of many, many headwaters. We have an obligation to do our best to take this trusted resource and protect it. We wanted to make sure that the people of West Virginia enjoyed this area. With Wild Appalachia, I'm Brandon Stover.
All right, cold, nasty couple days, and the Ohio River is going to be watching that very closely, especially from Point Pleasant north into the weekend. Sunday looks like it's the most decent day coming up, 60 in the afternoon with some sun. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Doug. And that'll do it for us at 6 o'clock. Our next newscast is over on Fox 11 in just a couple minutes. If you'd like to join us, make it a great night. Thousands still without power and some homes completely destroyed in the severe weather in our region. We have the latest in a live report. And now the focus transitioning from severe thunderstorms to colder weather and the Ohio River, which is going to be going into flood in many locations in the coming days. Eyewitness News at 630 on Fox 11 starts right now. Good evening and thank you for joining us here on Fox 11. Doug, you've been keeping your eye on not only the flooding potential, but also the cold weather that's supposed to set in tonight. It's already getting a little chilly right yeah, now. Yeah, it's a lot cooler today, but I'll tell you what, this time tomorrow you're going to be saying, boy, yesterday was pretty nice. It's, it's, it's going to be nasty. A lot more 30s, showers. Right? Yeah, 30s and 40s and wind and, and a lot more showers tomorrow too. So, mm -hmm. you know, when the sun's out here today, it's not half bad. And at least there's no severe weather. And in fact, we've had some rainbow sightings. Charleston had a little shower, and then it cleared out, had some sun. May have another shower coming up, though, so keep the umbrella handy. It's 40s and 50s out there right now, about 20 degrees cooler than yesterday. But we don't have those big storms either. You can see the showers tracking west to east with sunshine in between those. So these kind of come and go. There's a little shower cracking across Lincoln County. That'll skirt near downtown Charleston, and just, especially just south across the turnpike. And there's more back to the west. It could have a bit of lightning, maybe a pea-sized hail or a gust of wind with these, but they're not severe. But these will be with us through the evening hours as we fall through the 40s. 30s overnight, some wet snow and sleets uh, may start to mix in, especially in the higher spots. Now, we do still have residual flooding. Meigs County, Gallia, Lawrence County, Ohio, under flood warnings. For Meigs County, it's the Shade River, which is only very slowly dropping right now because the Ohio River is going up. It can't empty out. And Sims Creek is slowly rising, so we still have flood issues and road closures there. But the Ohio River itself is going to be the main focus in the coming days. That is rising, and it could go well above flood stage for Pomeroy and Racine especially. So areas north of Point Pleasant in particular, 
We've got a weather alert through Saturday. This is for the Ohio River and the tributaries. We're going to have backwater issues. The flooding up around the Pomeroy area likely be similar to 2018, and that was a significant flood for that area. So coming up, we'll detail that. We'll take a closer look at the forecast locally and how things are going to play out. It's going to be a rather unpleasant weather the next couple of days here. In fact, the mountains are under a winter storm warning, the high spots, and we'll talk about why in just a bit. All right, thank you, Doug. And many people are cleaning up after the storm created a path of damage through Kanawha County. Daniel Burbank joins us live right now in Cross Lanes near the epicenter of that storm damage. And Daniel, what are you seeing right now from your perspective? Well, I think it's important to note as well that the only way that we're able to communicate with you and I'm able to hear the show is actually via satellite phone. Uh, it, it does appear that at least one of the cellular networks has gone down in this area. It's not the first time that it has done this. Uh, we're getting SOS on, uh, on all of our phones here. Uh, now, the biggest difference, Dave, between yesterday and today is actually the temperature. Uh, it's a lot cooler than it is today, but I, I want to also point out the damage that is here. We are at the Carlton Apartments here uh, in Cross Lanes. Now, we're told that about 75 trees were downed. However, I have personally seen uh, dozens of them. It's important to note as well that people still do not have power here. Uh, now, AEP outage maps predict that people won't have the lights back on until about 11 p.m. Uh, Thursday night. Now, residents say they noticed the lights starting to flicker and they rushed to the bathtubs to close the blinds. One tenant describes that it kind of sounded like a whistling train, but as quick as this storm arrived, it was gone, leaving with it a path of destruction. It was really quiet and then there was some rain and a little bit of wind and then a little bit more wind, more wind, more wind. Eventually it ended up sounding like a train happened to just turn its engine off and just barreling down right beside you. So just lost IFB. Well, it's a day people here across the state won't soon forget. One neighbor telling me that she's also upset, not just for the people's homes that were destroyed, but for the birds' nests that she takes care of. We're continuing to have some uh, trouble here with, with our uh, network uh, uplink. So uh, if you are able to hear me, uh, we uh, are going to continue to follow this. It's also important to note that the city of Charleston uh, does have a damage form that people are able to fill out online. Uh, they are able to let the city know where they have damage at their property. It's also important to note that this online form does not mean that they're applying for aid. It's just so the city can keep a catalog of exactly what is going on so they know where to delegate resources. For now, live in Kanawha County, Daniel Burbank, Eyewitness News. Dave. All right, Daniel, thank you. Good information there. Well, a small area in Fayette County hit hard by a possible tornado. Anna Saunders takes us to the community of La Vista as those in the storm's path question where to even begin. Yeah, here in the La Vista area of Fayette County, it's hard to put the devastation into words. I've talked to people today who say these are like scenes you would expect in a place like Oklahoma or Kansas, never something they expected to see in West Virginia. I don't know. I don't know where to even begin. I don't know where you even begin other than the insurance. <laughs> I guess we're, I know my sons are coming with saws. I don't know, just go in and try to find what I can find that I can put somewhere. Looking at the destruction of her house, Marla Cart and so many others in the La Vista area are looking at a long road ahead. This after a quick and terrifying experience with a possible tornado. And stuff started flying by, so we started through the house, and that's when the roof come off and the ceiling collapsed on my husband and hit him in the head, but he's okay. And by then the storm was over. According to emergency management officials, an estimated 13 homes were damaged or destroyed, but surveys are still being done. And the National Weather Service will be out on Thursday to possibly confirm a tornado. A shelter where people can stay, bathe, eat, and wash clothes now open at the Midland Trail Community Center. It's always bad when you have to open a disaster shelter, but it really hits home when it's people that you've watched grow up. 
The Nuttall Fire Department serving as a staging area for volunteers and hot meals. You know, there's a lot of folks that says volunteer come over to help, you know, fix meals for people. Uh, in this morning, uh, we got uh, some of them trying to salvage some of the things out of their homes. Uh, there's probably realistically with the service department, friends, family, neighbors, 60, 70 people. Um, you know, loading things into U-Hauls and, and trailers, taking it to either family members' houses or storage units and, you know, to what they can salvage. The community banding together, always something to expect in a close-knit area like this, but the storm itself, not something anyone ever imagined in these hills. You think fire or something like that, but not a tornado. <laughs> not, of this, not of this magnitude, anyway. Now, a lot of the people around here are staying with family, but as we mentioned, there is that shelter open at the Midland Trail Community Center. In Fayette County, Anna Saunders, Eyewitness News. All right, Anna, thank you. And the Midland Trail Community Center is always taking donations of toiletries, and the main items needed right now by the fire department include tarps and trash bags, especially as that colder weather and possibly snow will be moving in. In other news, two people arrested in Jackson County after a fatal overdose investigation. According to the sheriff's office, Cody Lee Miller and Carlina Pennington are charged with drug delivery resulting in death and conspiracy to deliver fentanyl after a fatal overdose in Ravenswood last week. Both are being held on a $150,000 bond. And a woman dies after a fire that happened in Sissonville. It happened along Tahoe Road just after 9 o'clock last night. And the state fire marshal says a 52-year-old woman died and a man got injured and had to go to the hospital. Now, the cause of the fire is still being investigated. We will keep you updated. And we continue with our weather coverage and take a look at areas hit the worst. And we're also going to hear from a family and their story of a near-death experience. The National Weather Service is checking storm damage in many parts of our region today. Well, tonight, Gil McClanahan reports from Hanging Rock, Ohio. The National Weather Service says the winds that came through this area of Lawrence County, Ohio, were anywhere from 90 to 102 miles per hour. Those winds left a path of destruction. Those high winds left their mark on the Hanging Rock community of Lawrence County, Ohio. A nearby bar had the roof blown off and campers in a campground were either flipped onto their side or destroyed. It picked it up, it blew the roof off, all the windows blew out, ripped all the anchors up. Sid Rusk says she, her brothers and a friend were all hunkered down in the living room and the wind picked up their mobile home and slammed it to the ground. It sits six feet off the ground because of flooding. My younger brother tried to hold the screen door. The wind was just too, too much, so he kicked the door closed. We could feel the floor start to feel like a snake under. As far as cleanup goes, those living here in this area tell me the damage is so extensive and overwhelming, they don't know where to begin. 
in Lawrence County, Ohio. Gil McClanahan, Eyewitness News. All right, thank you, Gil. And the National Weather Service surveyed the damage today in seven counties. And we're waiting on the result of those surveys. As soon as we get them, we will pass those along to you. Meanwhile, let's look ahead into early next week. Monday, solar eclipse day. Might start off with some clouds and a shower. But by the afternoon, the, the key window for us is 2 to 4 in the afternoon, and especially around 3.15. And forecast models suggest clouds can break for some views of that solar eclipse. Fingers crossed. We'll take a closer look at that. And of course, some rather nasty days. Not going to see any sun the next couple. I'll detail why next. Weather Window, presented by the National Weather Desk. Five inches of rain in eastern Ohio triggered several mudslides. This one blocked a road. Another brought mud and debris to a cemetery. A little to the west, the Muskegon River overflowed its banks. In Wisconsin, it was a heavy, wet snow that brought trees down across Green Bay, including this one that fell on a car. And here's something you don't see every day, a double rainbow and the maddest clouds at the same time. For more content like this, follow the National Weather Desk on TikTok. Well, yeah, that cold front came through this morning and behind it, our temps are about 15, 20 degrees colder, even 25 degrees colder than this time yesterday. And that's actually a good thing because that means limited severe weather potential. In fact, none. Temps 40s, 50s. We still have some showers and we still have some thunder showers here because of some colder air aloft, creating some instability. These kind of come and go, and it seems like there's kind of two lines. One a little broken line along I-77 now and just to 119, and then another one west of Huntington, which is about to push through. So Charleston has a couple showers. We had one earlier, then the sun came out. Now it's cloudy over. Some more showers skirting, especially Southridge, Marmette, Kanawha City. Then there's a break. Huntington, still dry there, but there is a little thunder shower just west around Ashland Ironton. Not severe. Could be some pea-sized hail within that, though. We've had a couple of those crossing through the coal fields as well. And then probably the most impressive cells are around West Liberty and Morgan County. That's, you know, pretty hefty one. You definitely want to have an umbrella handy. This is a fairly widespread batch, so Huntington will definitely get some rain here in the next hour. And eventually, I think Charleston will probably see some more showers returning by about 8, 8.30 this evening. So, yeah, unsettled. But it hasn't been all bad today. Unfortunately, this low is going to drift a little closer to us tomorrow. You see all this stuff? There's no sun here. It's just showers. And, yeah, that's what's going to be moving in here for tomorrow. Now, we're not going to be adding much in the rainfall bucket here overall. And it's not going to add the flooding problems. The problem for flooding along the Ohio River is because of this. Over the last several days, Pittsburgh and eastern Ohio, you saw that from before, they had about five, six inches of rain. Where's all that going? Down the Ohio River. And that's why Racine and Pomeroy now forecasted to get up near or above major flood stage. Very close in Racine. I'm going to put it major floods right there. This is basically where we hit what we hit in 2018. So same kind of impacts there, and that was a significant impact, certainly for the Pomeroy area. Now, as you get further downstream, we don't have the contribution coming in from the Kanawha River. 
and other tributaries. We didn't get as much rain. So Point Pleasant, moderate flood stage here, likely by Friday afternoon. I think Racine and Pomeroy would quest uh, around midday Friday or mid Friday morning. And then eventually that works down to Huntington. At that point, though, it's more like a minor flood. It's right around flood stage. There'll be backwater issues for sure, all the tributaries going into the Ohio there. But then that will work its way towards Portsmouth here, and that would be about Saturday. Scattered showers, maybe a thunder shower this evening. So, you know, brief downpours, and then it clears out again. It's kind of a strange setup. Overnight, though, clouds fill in completely, and by dawn, we've got a lot more showers, and some of this could have some sleet, the pink, and some wet snow mixed in. And that's a lot more activity tomorrow than we had today, and it's pretty much all day. You know, at least there were some breaks here today. I don't think we're get, we get much above 40 tomorrow. I know that gives us 45. That might be generous. It's blustery. It's nasty tomorrow. In the mountains, a high terrain, it's mostly, if not all, snow. And Friday, well, no improvement. It basically looks the same as tomorrow. So next couple of days are really nasty days and uh, just got to bundle up there. Hopefully we can get the power back because the nights, especially 30s and probably even some 20s heading into the weekend. Up at ski country, yes, yeah, six inches or more snow. Now, as you get down, yeah, I think a grassy couple inches of snow likely, and this would come mostly at night, Richwood, parts of Webster County, and even, you know, Beckley, Fayetteville, Somerset, I'm not sure about two, but maybe an inch on the grass, especially come Thursday night, Friday morning, the roads would be okay. And the rest of us, you know, you're going to probably see some flakes or at least some sleet mixed in at times, Thursday and Friday, that kind of setup. Saturday, I think, is mostly in the mountains, but still a lot of clouds and it's chilly. Sunday's the better day. We'll start off in the 20s, but get up to 60 in the afternoon and then 70 Monday and hopefully clear out some morning clouds in the afternoon to view that eclipse. All right. Thank you, Doug. Well, it's said to be one of the prettiest places you'll ever find in the mountain state. Coming up next in Wild Appalachia, we're going to take you to Canaan Valley and show you how the wildlife refuge there is expanding and how that could help places far away. You know, if you've been there, you know, Canaan Valley is one of the most unique places you'll ever find in West Virginia, and its wildlife refuge is now expanding. In this edition of Wild Appalachia, Brandon Stover tells us how this not only benefits the local plants and animals, but also to places further away. Canaan Valley is a special place. At 3,200 feet above sea level, it's the highest large valley you'll find east of the Mississippi River. 
This also makes it one of the coldest spots you'll find in the eastern United States. This area mimics um, uh, lands similar to that of Canada, given the elevation here. These rare plants found out of place, along with the animals, are protected here since it's a national wildlife refuge. Now that protection will extend even farther. The Nature Conservancy was able to purchase uh, the 1,971 acres that uh, uh, makes up the northern portion of the uh, refuge. And then over the course of the next year, Fish and Wildlife was able to gather together the resources to purchase the uh, uh, property. You don't see homes in any direction, you don't see other developments, so it's really a place where nature is the, the main, you know, driving factor. This area heavily depends on recreation and tourism, but the bridge between letting nature be and having fun has worked here for many years. We want to keep that wild and wonderful character of the of the property, but still make it to where people can get out and, and, and enjoy the property. So, you know, we're working closely with, with the refuge and their staff to help envision uh, trail connectivity. There's trails that, that start and end on either uh, end of the new property, so we want to connect those trails. Part of the northern section of this valley was a private hunting club. But to Powell's surprise, the reaction was actually a positive one. Because of things like, you know, increased development, the development of the Corridor H and different things that are happening, people really got behind that vision of seeing this property protected in perpetuity. That protection will also benefit places far from here. It's a large wetland complex. So the property that we just protected are the headwaters of the Little Blackwater River uh, that join the Blackwater River just downstream. You're maintaining that, that flood mitigation. You're, you're continuing to have clean drinking water available. Just get to see uh, a piece of nature that hasn't been impacted by infrastructure or by um, humans very much. With Wild Appalachia, I'm Brandon Stover. And we'll be right back. Doug Harlow has a final check of your forecast.
All right, we just got the results from the storm survey. Two confirmed tornadoes yesterday in Boyd County, one near Cannonsburg, the other around Westwood. One EF1, 110 mile an hour winds. The other EF2, 120 mile an hour winds. They were both kind of in the same strength category. Several microbursts confirmed as well. So we're still kind of digesting the uh, report here that just came in. Nasty cold days with rain, sleet, snow. Thursday, Friday, a little drier Saturday. Most of that shifts east, but still cold. We'll get up to about 60 Sunday and hopefully be able to view the solar eclipse Monday afternoon at 70. That'll be something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Doug. And that'll do it for us here on Fox 11. We'll see you tonight at 10 o'clock. Make it a great night.